I'm Shelly Gazdek. I'm from the IC3 movement itself. Um, so I am our director of outreach and partnerships globally. Um, and then I will, at some point, reintroduce you. Uh, Preeti, okay, we'll just take a moment. There we go. Um, so yeah, so good afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Um, today, we are really going to explore a strategic approach to improving university recruitment um, by forging stronger relationships with schools um, and then in turn students and their families. We'll delve a little bit into the concept that while universities, uh, like things like university fairs and direct to students uh, recruitment efforts can create immediate results, um, really the long term benefits of engaging, educating, and empowering schools and students is far more substantial and sustainable for your universities. Um, so by the end of this presentation, you should have kind of a significant uh, knowledge of the holistic approach to recruitment and how it can build year on year um, success for your institution. And of course, we have most of the universities in the room, but I want to acknowledge that we do have some schools here as well, so we can share experiences. There's going to be a panel discussion, um, so feel free to ask questions. But before we get started with that math and feedback, I want to do a poll. You guys should have um, virtually, um, you guys should have a QR code. Um, you can use this one. We're going to do a little Mentimeter to get to know our audience a little bit. There are QR codes kind of spread across the room on little pieces of paper if you guys want to pass them around. Or, um, you know, there's the Menti code here. The direct link. So whatever works, I'm going to give you guys a second. Um, but we just want to understand a little bit who's in the room. But there should be little squares. Uh, so there's more than one question. Did you just get? Yeah, I will, cha I will change the slide. Yeah. yeah. So the so first the one is just I want to understand the role. I know there's a lot of universities, some schools in here, but really to understand: Are you a recruiter? Do you work in outreach? Do you work in missions? What what kind of the the significant roles? See, most of us are university reps, university recruiters. Um, there's some marketing yeah. managers in here, marketing coordinator. Um, so really, uh, some good medals. So some good different ones. Um, thank you guys. I'm trying to learn how to use the PC in this moment. Um, so the next slide, if I can click it, is, is really for university. So what is the focus at your university? Um, for enrollment management, whether you work in marketing, admissions, maybe you work in communication or outreach, what are the, the things that you focus on at your university? Ooh, we're having a battle here with the student numbers, geography, we're really checking out. This is great. It seems like most of us are really uh, looking at student fit. Um, we still have some sales numbers, some ROIs. We have geography in there. So uh, really, really nice to see kind of what you guys are looking at. Um, the second question for universities is really, what do you use to recruit the most? Um, is it lead providers? Is it counselors? Do you work with ed tech companies, agents, or maybe anyone that would choose? So it looks like most of us are working with high school counselors. We have a lot of agents, independent consultants, some working with other kind of lead providers, a tech company, um, the majority between agents and high school counselors. And then the last question is really for the schools. So what ways are you currently connecting or engaging with your universities? I know there's only a couple schools in here, so uh, I'm not sure. 
you guys so most of you know it's changed in the university there okay thanks guys that really helps us understand a little bit okay we don't have some more virtual sessions teaching workshops that's great okay thank you that's super helpful to understand i'm going to now let um, our dear friend if i can get this uh, really introduce the panelists. So thank you for, for letting us know what you're doing. It's great to see that we have a really good mix of maybe we're doing emails, but maybe we're also doing some different efforts like workshops. Um, so I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so I think first up is Namaste, my name is Rachna Talsanya. I'm a high school and college counselor. Um, it's been eight to nine years I'm into this field. So basically I'm on, I'm from the both sides. I have been a consultant uh, for quite a few years, say four and a half years. Um, I used to help students with the university admissions and visa filing for that period of time. And um, with IC3, I joined one of the IB and IESC school wherein I'm into again high school and College career counseling. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. My name is Dan Marshner. I'm the director of international mission at Loyola Marymount University uh, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, been there uh, seven years. Finished out seven years. Started my eighth year this year, uh, and then previous to that, I did seven years where I went to school myself at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. So both in the U.S. Um, so, you know, in terms of the kind of things that I oversee as a director, um, well, normally uh, I travel, you know, a good amount uh, in the fall, uh, but I'm doing an extra special amount this year because I have a colleague who uh, is very, we're all very excited that he's going to uh, become a father for the second time in September. Uh, so it's lovely for him and his family, very excited for him. So it's going to be wonderful for him. Uh, for us, it means that I'll be doing a lot more um, travel this, this fall. Um, I've been part of the uh, content and research committee for a few years. Um, I also am part of the, uh, if you're familiar, there's another organization uh, that is uh, important to me as well, uh, that is the International Association for, for College Admissions Counseling. Um, and so I'm actually part of the executive board for that as well. Um, and then we've also been blessed to have welcomed groups of counselors uh, to campus as part of the KIC Counselor Corps or a few times uh, at LMU. And so I can talk more about that as well. But again, thanks for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. It is, I understand it's very difficult to be in a, awake in a session after lunch and Shelly's uh, doing really good, uh, good work of, you know, sending polls and making you people talk so that, you know, you don't go, uh, I mean, go, for, go asleep. And I see a few coffees in the hands as well of people. So that's that's really keeping you awake. Thank you very much for coming to our session. Uh, my name is Pava Kriyas. I'm an international recruitment officer for University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, uh, I have been uh, about 18 years in higher education, both in India and Canada. Prior to moving to Canada, I was uh, a professor and director of admission at Ahmedabad University in Ahmedabad. And uh, four years back, I went uh, to Canada on a permanent residency. And then Waterloo hired me, so I've been uh, traveling back uh, to India, and that is what is one of the my favorite thing. Uh, my passion for teaching continues, so I keep on. Uh, I, I teach uh, these days uh, business strategy and business research as courses uh, uh, in Waterloo in Canada, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I have been, uh, you know, into a lot of things, mainly into research, strategy, design uh, for universities and uh, this, uh, putting outreach strategies in place. I have been uh, associated with IC3 for a long time. This is my sixth IC3 annual conference. I have missed just one uh, since when I moved to Canada. And then, of course, because of that, I'm a part of uh, Inclusion, Diversity, and uh, Scholarship Committee at IC3. Uh, and also I'm a reviewer uh, for proposals at NAFSA. So 
that's been a nutshell of what I have been doing in this field and a little bit outside of this field. Thank you very much for having us today. Thank you, all three of you, for being so great. This hopefully will get you guys thinking about what the questions that you might want to be asking. Um, before we jump in directly to the panel, I'd like to briefly discuss what we're talking about. Like, what was the difference between working with, with directly with students versus empowering students, families, um, and what does that look like in schools? Um, so, as many of you know and probably already do, uh, when recruiting students using direct to student recruitment efforts, such as high school or university fairs, lead providers, agents, really areas where you're looking at um, working with students over the last kind of two years of high school, um, they do provide a very nice, quick, immediate impact or influx of students for that school year. Um, they really allow you to see prospective students, maybe you increase because you can go to a university fair someplace where you had before, and you see a couple new students from there. So these are ways that you can improve in a short period of time, um, really looking at specific uh, results. Um, however, they do often result in kind of transient engagement and may not lead to strong enrollment numbers year on year. So what you can think about is these direct to student kind of recruitment efforts are, are like the low hanging fruit, right? Um, you need them when they're about to graduate. You kind of say, yes, this one looks good, this one looks good, this one looks good. Um, but they might not have been fully engaged in your university, maybe they don't even really understand um, a lot. So you might not be getting students that are the right fit, maybe a little bit less engaged, and you're trying to sway them and win them over other universities. So really looking at how can we build more robust relationships, so instead of trying to get these, these low-hanging fruits at the end, how do we, how do we get uh, yielding results year on year? Um, so really, it's, it's, it's involved engaging with different institutions and students over a period of time. So not just looking at the final two years, um, but maybe, you know, I have some universities that I know start with students in elementary school, for instance. And that, that really builds trust. It allows you to grow your potential applicants uh, for years to come. And it also means you don't have to go back to the same places every year, right? You can, you can ensure that you know that these counselors at these schools have trust in you, but we don't need to see you every year. Uh, this will create kind of more consistent growth, normality, and actually better fit students coming in. So what do we really mean by that? What does that look like? Uh, so when talking about long-term relationships with schools, we're really referring to educating, empowering, um, and engaging those schools. So I like to call that the three E's of sustainable approach. Um, you are basically building trust with families. So what do we mean by each of these three areas? Um, edu educating schools is really sharing insights. So this could be insights into your application process, it could be into your um, scholarship opportunities, maybe career prospects that tie to those um, programs. And that is empowering students and counselors in turn. Um, this, this kind of knowledge allows them to create better equipped decisions, maybe they have better recommendations for students, and ultimately provide you with better, higher quality uh, students that are coming. Um, empowering is, is similar, but it's slightly different, so you can provide them with, let's say, resources. So instead of just giving them insights about application process or having short-term kind of conversations when you're empowering, you're giving them research, research, resources, materials, tools um, that can guide students more effectively. But then it also could be mean, meaning supporting different programs at schools. Maybe you support a women in science program, or maybe you support a certain scholarship that ties back to a program that you have at your school. So really, these, this is helping students see in the long term how you build trust within their institutions. Families might see that. Maybe there's a scholarship you offer a school every year, and students want to be engaged in that scholarship process and want to know more about your university. So this is really how we can empower schools. And then engaging is really fostering the schools to create a sense of purpose, uh, a sense of partnership. So a lot of, you know, I'll let, I'll let the experts speak over here, but um, this might include different interactions. Maybe you teach a workshop for them. Maybe you have a professor come in um, and showcase, uh, do a seminar, um, or showcase different projects that you're working on, or you actually include students in maybe a project that your university is hosting. So that really creates genuine interest among students um, to come back and really understand your university. And this can be started you know, way before 11 or 12. You can do things through elementary school and middle school to really get students engaged um, for the long term. 
So hopefully that can help you kind of start envision envisioning what we're talking about between the difference of you know, short-term versus long-term relationships, um, and then how to build those long-term partnerships. But I am going to make sure that, um, that's not what I wanted to go previous, uh, make sure that, that we have questions for the panel. And you guys have plenty of time to ask questions. So um, first, that you are our viewers and how you're engaging. Um, I guess how, as a, how do you as a school prefer to engage with universities, maybe different methods, and how do you communicate with universities as a preferred um, yeah, so mine is um, IB and IEC school. Um, and in our school, we usually focus on the sustainability, not just after COVID, but even before COVID. So uh, how do, I would like to break this question into two parts. One is how do I, as a school counselor, connect with universities? And how do I introduce universities to my students? So, um, you know, how I as a counselor connect with universities um, through uh, master classes, through uh, online sessions. Um, ICT helps a lot to connect with universities directly. Look for what are students who they look for? And um, regarding introducing universities to my students, uh, what we in a school do is we, uh, you know, categorize students into different groups. Uh, because there are all kinds of students and there are all kinds of universities. Okay. It depends where exactly they fit in. So there'll be students who will be looking for, um, you know, some of the best schools, maybe I will be some of the best schools. There are some students who will be looking for the maximum scholarship. That's what their target is. Uh, there'll be some students who, will, who want to balance both. Blur, I'm not clear. Blur, I'm not clear. So I don't know what exactly students are looking for. When I, as a counselor, guide students, it's not just the course or it's not just the university, but there are many factors which we consider as a school or as a counselor, such as, um, you know, the personality of the students, where exactly they would fit in, but they're in a smaller group or maybe in a larger group. So I think that's where counselors come into a picture. And maybe education fairs is uh, not enough to, you know, to fit, uh, or maybe uh, or maybe consider all these criterias. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, in our school, mostly we go virtual, we connect with the university directly and conduct patients for a group of students who be interested in applying to that university. Uh, there are other platforms as well, uh, you know, uh, to find out part about that thing. Uh, maybe, um, you know, uh, there are many such organizations, like Patient USA, uh, which connect uh, universities to the students. So I think those are the right uh, resources uh, for because there'll be unbiased, uh, you know, information. Yeah. Um, but first, I'm going to go on to the back. Um, so based on that, Lillian, like all the things that Rahan was looking at, um, what what do you prioritize as individuals? What do you think might be uh, too little or too much in terms of university engagement at school? Thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, I start with from my side. There are reaching out to counselors uh, for a lot of uh, kind of offerings yeah, that they yeah. have. So, uh, counselors get flooded with the requests from universities. And believe me or not, uh, they, they love us, they want to encourage us, but it is beyond their bandwidth of doing things with universities and engaging people with universities. So uh, that, that being said, also the time that they have is really limited is what I found. You know, they're really part-time teaching, part-time they are doing career counseling work. They are they're meeting students, long meetings, their parents, they have sort of administrative responsibilities at home, uh, at, at the office, and of course, uh, responsibilities at home. So I, I said, Again, their, their, their entire day is way easier than what it looks to me 
for my university uh, for, for, from their side. So I would I would always try to be uh, a little nice and a general. So one of the things I would uh, uh, I would try and offer uh, at least in my strategies about outreach to uh, schools is try and offer something which is virtual, which is not seconded. Uh, uh, you know, so a lot of times my session will be out of the school times and they will be virtual or uh, virtual mode. Few reasons why why I we like it, and uh, one of them is of course we can't significantly on the travel cost because on the university side I know uh, a lot of people did not talk about the ROI here, but I will talk about the ROI. Right? I mean, how much money you are spending on a city, on a school, on a uh, on a particular geography, you are going to get evaluated by your managers, and they will say, okay, you went three times to this particular school and have more applications. About it, what is happening with their school? So it's not exactly like we want five students or fifteen students from that particular geography, but it is like the echo that we get back from that geography, and that is where I talk about the ROIs of the course. So uh, virtual also gives us a lot. So go a little slow, give more time to the guidance counselors to respond to you. Uh, try and do virtual. I mean. And uh, you know, over a period of time, it's the right for a student that we want to do this. So I'm, I'm more interested in uh, you know getting the right student and getting the numbers for that particular geography. So numbers are great to have; it looks great on PowerPoints when you present it to your managers. But uh, uh, then you are on your own in a podcast. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, yes. Thanks, uh, I think mentioning virtual is is obviously everyone is doing virtual sessions with students nowadays. Uh, but that hasn't always been the case in schools. Haven't always been as open to virtual seminars as they are now. I think from that, Dan, maybe you can talk about if anything what's changed over the last four to five years. Um, have you changed any of your priorities um, based on based on those virtual changes? Or uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, we go down memory lane here a little bit. Um, uh, my, my personal experience in March 2020, uh, I was actually in Washington, D.C. Uh, for an event that was meeting with uh, U.S. congressional leaders. And I remember being in an office and looking at a, a TV screen that said, Big Bad, Big Bad, oh, yeah. Uh, and that's when oh, pandemonium broke out and uh, all the We were simply that behind us at the moment, but again, uh, so again, obviously a lot of, in the, in the midst of this last five years, everything has changed to some, some extent, extent uh, and to some, some another, another sense of not a lot has changed, right? Uh, uh, I would say, you know, some of the things, I'd say, you know, some of the things that really stuck out to me um, is really the, 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 the really the duck session, the session being involved in a brand new way. Uh, more than that, we tried to be virtual and it seemed like they were just completely really uh, uh, so I think so especially when we've been in the we work with school with a school organized that's really helped organize the event that's made a big difference. Um, but again we've gone from, uh, but again we've gone from you know traveling pretty extensively traveling pretty extensively uh, at LV specifically to obviously uh just doing all virtual events at all kinds of hours in the morning uh and remember the good old days at three o'clock in the morning information sessions and presentations we just sitting there right we just sitting there and you're like oh Completely aware. I know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, so the, uh, but yeah, so the went from that to now being back to travel a lot. Uh, no, so it's obviously uh, no, so it's obviously lots of ways to work. Uh, the other thing to just to note as well, I should uh, should back up a little bit. University representatives, university representatives here. How many of you are U.S. schools? Okay. All right. So okay. Schools, so that's great. Right. So so that's pretty good question. Think about half. So if you're not a U.S. university, please raise your hand. Okay, so yeah, about half. Okay, okay so, yeah, uh, so so it's really important to note uh, so uh, that if you uh, are not a U.S. institution, that this context is really important, and that um, what we do have in the U.S. are mascots. So you could be a Spartan, you could be a Rambler, you could be a Tar, and on list goes on and on and on. So we have nice marketing materials and all that kind of stuff, right? What we do not have is a national strategy. So essentially, what you're talking about are four thousand institutions that are all operating independently. So what that could mean is that we could all be constantly fighting each other for students all the time. 
And to some extent, that's true, right? But I think what we also find is incredibly impactful and helpful in the work that we do is collaboration with institutions that have like-minded ideals, uh, or mainly are just good people to travel with, generally speaking. Uh, and so from that perspective, going back into working with groups to be able to make an experience a little more uh, positive while you're traveling, uh, to be able to really engage with counselors. We, we often find that, that schools are much more comfortable. I mean, you could talk about this to some extent as well with a, a handful of schools uh, versus uh, trying to invite, you know, if they're going to, if you have 50 schools coming to your 50 universities, excuse me, coming to your school, that's a big undertaking, right? If you have one unit, one university coming to your school, maybe you have a, you know, have so many different competing responsibilities. Uh, so again, we found that that's really helpful to, to travel with that group of uh, three or four. That's really made, make things a lot easier. Um, but again, I think there's, there's always that question of, um, well, really, when I, whenever I come to India myself, I'm not based here. Uh, and so I come for a few weeks and I go back home and I always feel like there's so much more that I could do. And so there's always a challenge of trying to really think about how you can utilize whatever opportunities you have to maintain, to, to continue to, to be present in a place where you can't physically be all the time. So. Um, I would want to add here, I mean, definitely um, for universities, education fairs could be helpful, but you know, uh, as a school, when it comes to uh, location, it plays a major role. As a school, as a counselor, the kind of combination that I want in the list of universities, which is coming on campus, I think it's tricky. It's again a task to, you know, call the kind of universities that, that my students would be targeting. So again, I mean, it depends on the location as well, uh, like how effective education fairs could be. And even from the university side, you know, as Pavak say, you're looking for um, best fit, which students, what kind of students would fit into your institution. So targeting those kind of, uh, you know, schools or universities uh, could be helpful. Yeah. I mean. Thanks, uh, Rachan. Just to go off of that um, a little bit, um, you as a school, what what is the way that you prefer universities to effectively engage with you, maybe outside the university sphere? Is there yeah. mostly we would go for uh, virtual sessions, be it on a scholarship or maybe on the admissions, especially when it comes to universities abroad. Um, I belong to a school which is, I mean, it's located in Rajkot, Gujarat. So there is less of a connectivity. So it is difficult to, you know, arrange uh, education fairs there. But um, I have, you know, a diversified group of students uh, majorly going to US and we have a lot more US universities here. So what we do is, I as a counselor connect with universities in person in such kind of conferences that actually helps me to guide students. And then I introduce, uh, you know, universities to students in a group. Those who are planning to go to U US, I'll conduct a online session. I'll directly contact to the university and, you know, ask them that, hey, we have this kind of students. If we can arrange a session on admissions, maybe on a scholarship. So, yeah. And there are, um, you know, uh, various uh, platforms as well. I connect with them as well. It could be uh, College Pass, if you have heard. It could be uh, Education USA. It could be Red Pen. Because they uh, are not, they don't have tie up with the universities. They are okay with any universities to connect with any universities. So even they help me to, you know, connect with the university and um, arrange sessions. Yeah. And there's one example that I would like to share. Uh, yesterday night itself, uh, I got a call from parents. That stood, I don't know if there's anyone from UIC here, University of Illinois, Illinois uh, Chicago. I would like to connect with that person because uh, <laughs> what happened was, uh, it's a funny story. What happened was student was admitted into um, an undergrad first year. He went to the university, uh, university it was his first day and he's calling me that, hey, uh, now university is asking me to do an extra English course. What do I do? I'm like, okay, give me a day. I'm in a conference. I'll get in touch with the university representative if, if I can find and I'll get back to you. So this, this, this conference is actually helps us as a counselor, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. I do want to open it up and make sure we have plenty of time for questions from the audience. Um, so... Um, is anyone, is anyone brave, brave enough, enough to start us off? off? I can I keep asking questions, but uh, if, if anyone's anyone brave enough to start us off, I know there's, there's people, people online virtually. So um, just, just raise your hand and we can bring the mic around. 
and please raise your hand if you're on the Zoom meeting as well, and we're, we'll let you know if there's questions. Hi, my name is Nicoletta. I'm representing Constructor University in Germany. Thank you for today's session. I wanted to follow up on the suggestion to do online events because my experience has been the opposite. Every time I try to propose online events, actually schools say that they would prefer more in-person events. After COVID, they've been quite tired. The students are not engaged online. Um, have you experienced that? Thank you. Uh uh, well, uh, it is right. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, universities also want to meet us in person. So are the students. Uh, I, I'm talking about more about from my side, from where, what kind of outreach that I do. So uh, I recruit for faculty of math and mathematics. So uh, I understand math is not everybody's choice and everybody's liking. So what we would normally do is uh, we would we would do a virtual fair or a virtual session, a problem solving session, and we would invite, we would blast invites. So to a bunch of people, a bunch of guidance counselors with just a request is like, please forward it to your students. Most schools have, uh, uh, you know, the student emailing system. So they, they just hit forward to our mails. And uh, it could be like out of 500 students or out of 200 students in a particular grade 11 or grade 12 class might be just 10 sign up. But when I blast a message to say 50 or 100 schools, you know, five students from 50 schools is 250. That is my Zoom capacity. So that serves purpose for me. A, B, that gives me right fit students. Uh, and that really helps me to, to have them online. Uh, and second, I mean, I, I would follow it up with based on the registration number, say Rachna's school had some great number of student registering. And I said, Rachna, we had, I, I looked at the numbers, they're great. Do you want me to come and talk to your students in person? And then I would plan that in my following visit, the, the visit to that school. Uh, but I mean, so finding first right fit student and then reaching out to school is probably more suitable for my outreach strategies than to go to school at, and do a kind of cold calling is like, you know, I want to meet your students. And then there are hardly three students show up or a guidance counselor will push a class and the stu I, I'm in a, I'm in the middle of a bunch of disinterested students. Right. So that's what I, that's what my strategy is. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, uh, being a school in India, you know, uh, you know, students are not very. The curriculum does not allow us a lot of, uh, uh, like, uh, people coming in every day and talking about universities. And there are so many. There's a plethora of right. universities around, and they want to. So we prefer that we can have an online session, and maybe when we find genuine audience out of that then we may we might again have a small online session which can be a very interactive session uh, maybe because it is not obviously not possible to have a, a yeah. physical session all the time so i believe we keep filtering that way and come to a genuine bunch of four to five students like my campus every year to four, 300 students graduate from class 12 so we can have some students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so really so like working like with the counselor to, and yeah, yeah. 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 working with, with, with you know, yeah. the counselors yeah. to really understand yeah. what those students yeah. are, what's going to be beneficial yeah. and valuable yeah. to them, right? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so to respond to your question as well, I feel like from our experience, virtual tools are something that we still feel like has value and we want to utilize them. Um, but I agree, we, we've certainly had our fair share of uh, even virtual fairs that have been, you know, very disappointing. Uh, or events that we just don't. They, so, for example, um, sometimes we've attended virtual events and uh, very, very minimal student interaction takes place at all. The main benefit we get is that we get a list of students who have registered and we can follow up with them from there. But that's, you know, uh, in terms of really getting that, that really, you know, impactful conversation or experience, that's pretty rare. Um, any kind of just kind of general presentation about our university doesn't get any traction either from what we've seen. What we have seen is that individual students are happy to have Zoom meetings with us. And so I think that's, that's a, and, I, and again, I think that familiarity uh, is, is significant. I mean, I, um, I'm still kind of amazed, honestly, that Skype, which we we're using before the pandemic, did not become the dominant platform, right? Doesn't that kind of make sense? Oh, yeah. But anyway, 
Um, that, that's a topic for another day. But um, but so so I think the, the there's definitely a familiarity with Zoom. I'll have many conversations with students, and they'll say, you know, do you want to have a brief? And they, and a Zoom conversation, and they're very much interested in that. Uh, the other thing we've seen some traction with in terms of virtual sessions are the master class kind of things that I think a lot of us have talked about. Students will be interested in attending a session about their specific interests, like you were just saying. But again, uh, a general session or introduction to the university or, you know, let's have, we'll have a, a virtual college fair generally has, has been a struggle uh, in our experience. Um, I mean, I can say our colleagues that uh, the, we work pretty closely with KIC Univisys. Uh, their Webby fairs, we find that are are probably the strongest option we have um, to put a plug in for them. But um, but again, we certainly had our fair share of which is a, which is a really fun experience when you're up at two a.m. Uh, and you're really excited to meet with all these students and you talk to three in three hours. So yeah. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Yeah. yeah. Who can be? Who can get there first? <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Ruby. Hi there, my name is Sujit, uh, Loyola Chicago. So this question is actually for Rachna. Um, is there any topics or anything that you feel uh, universities covered more? Uh, for example, one of the school visits that we did, they talked a little bit about you know covering a lot more information on internships and what OPT actually looks like in the US. So anything that you've noticed that uh, did much better or had more traction, um, love to know. Um. Again, I would say, uh, see, it depends what kind of crowd you are addressing to. Uh, some students might be looking for a good amount of scholarship. Uh, some of my students, they don't, they don't, they don't care about budget. Uh, they would basically look at the reputation, uh, maybe ranking. Some of the uh, students are, you know, much concerned about the location. Uh, so it depends what kind of crowd that you are addressing to. So that's why it's very important uh, as a university to, you know, be very specific. What crowd are you looking for? If there's a university such as University of Waterloo, as far as I know, they are highly selective. So def definitely they would be looking for a quality of, you know, quality in the students and diversity in the classroom. So there's nothing excessive, nothing less. It depends on the, the crowd that you are addressing to. What exactly the crowd sitting here is looking for are they coming from a middle class background maybe they are looking for a good university but they are equally you know interested to know that is there any scholarship if there if it is there what all what all are the criteria what do i focus on do i focus on academics do i focus on say uh, extracurriculars or do do you as a university consider both do you consider the financial background of the students so i mean yeah i mean addressing the right uh, crowd would be, you know, helpful. Yeah. And, and just, just to, to open, open that question up, up, sorry, sorry before we move, move on, on, I'll get, get there. Um, to other schools, schools that are in the room, are, are you know, are, are, are can you, you is there anything that you want to add to what Rachel was saying about maybe what has worked better for universities that have worked with you? If there's anything in particular that's worked better than other, yeah. Okay. Yeah, do you want to think that mic is not turned on? Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, hi, I'm Janvi from Minerva University. My question is really connected there because I was going to say that um, I guess especially in these regions, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, however much the counselors and the students put an effort into um, making that decision and that long drawn out decision process, parents are the decision makers. So uh, if you can, uh, I guess my question is to all the entire room really, um, schools, how do you as counselors, what kind of relationship do you develop with the parent or more crudely, what sort of influence do you have on their decision making when it comes to, um, I guess, more like newer universities or more different universities, you're not traditional choices. Um, and to the university representatives, how do you approach the parent quotient when you're engaging with the counselors? Because it's rare that you get direct access um, to the parents, if at all, ever, right? Um, yeah, so that's my question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, well, I would say um, certainly that, that's a very significant and um, important stakeholder group to consider. Uh, I would say, you know, generally speaking, it depends upon the time of year we're talking about. We do tend to, when, when we're trying to get talk to students about who might be interested in applying, I, I would say that the experiences, the interaction we have with parents tend to be fairly minimal. Uh, unless they're, you know, attending an event together with their parents and we have that interaction. Uh, we don't do a lot of uh, parent focused kind of application generation, for lack of a better term, workshops necessarily. We do, uh, when we transition to more of uh, working with admitted students, though, and try to see if they're really serious about coming, then it's much more serious so you connect them with the parents. Uh, but generally speaking, we do try to do some messaging, uh, just kind of when we do, when we send out, you know, uh, large uh, blast emails about things that are happening on campus, we tend to try to incorporate the parents as well. The challenge, of course, is, you know, in terms of contact information, especially for someone who hasn't applied yet, the, the information we have is very, very minimal. Uh, but every once in a while, we get a student who indicates their parents' email or, or lets us know. And so we can do a little bit more there. But again, generally speaking, we're more effective working with parents when they, that we've already made that that connection. Um, and, and I, you know, I generally as well, um, most of the time this works out great, but I tend to be very, uh, very generous with with get pushing, out, uh, pushing out my WhatsApp number, for example, to parents and students. Again, most of the time it's fine. Uh, but every so often it's, it gets a little crazy. But again, I think that helps in terms of the, the facility of uh, the, the familiarity and, and their, their comfort level with me. So I don't recommend it if you don't, if you are very much anti, you know, what's that message at five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon? Because uh, you're going to get a lot of those. Uh, but again, but otherwise, I think it's really effective. Anything? Mm. Right. I think my, um, I would uh, second Dan's, uh, 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 you know, uh, views about it. And uh, my interaction with parents has been on a different stage of application process. There has been a different set of interaction that happens. So <clears throat> usually when we do a bunch of online and virtual events, one of the good things or one of the things that I really like is we we position at a time when it is probably a Friday evening or a Thursday evening uh, in India or whatever geography that is. So where the students and parents both can listen to our spiel on university and admissions and scholarships and everything else. That's the first point of contact when we reach to the parents. Uh, a bunch of parents do reach out to us because they don't like to see us virtually and they want to like, you know, physically see Pawak is a human being, is a person. So uh, when I'm on recruitment travel, usually I, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I have in my signature my Calendly uh, link and I would, I would be happy to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Suppose I'm in Hyderabad today and tomorrow morning there are two parents coming to see me. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, just sit out there in the lounge and maybe have a chat with them about what Waterloo is or or a bunch of questions that they have about. Uh, but initial stage, it is, uh, you know, they want to know about the university. Uh, but as the application becomes a little more firmer, you know, when a student applies in total, and then when uh, they get an offer of admission, for example, from University of Waterloo, they have a lot of questions about scholarship, residences, uh, atmosphere with Canada and East Coast. It's about the weather and you know how how freezing it is in Canada and a bunch of stuff uh, that are that are the questions uh, that we get. Even vegetarian food, if we get for our students, or, I mean our kids or not. So all sorts of questions and um, you know one on one. Meetings meetings really help us either over zoom or uh i mean if i'm traveling but if it is say rajkot and i'm not traveling i would be happy to do a one on one zoom call with the parents so we have on our website uh the connect with us page where there are zoom links and parents because parents are busy so they they would also want to have uh find time to meet us at their convenient time so that's the calendly or i believe microsoft also has one of those kind of uh Microsoft uh, booking system, I think that works for me. I personally don't prefer giving WhatsApp number of mine because of the reasons Dan said uh, to parents, but they are always with the guidance counselor. So guidance counselor will say, okay, uh, Rachna would probably send me, I have one parent who want to see and I will, I will share the Calendly link. But I personally don't share my WhatsApp number with the parent. 
until the student is probably confirmed, you know, at the final stage of confirmation when they're paying fees or or bunch of stuff like that. And I would I would just add like and in schools you can you can say this uh, as with like add to this as well. But um this, I think this is why it's important that working with college counselors, especially early on, letting them know about your university. It's important, right? So giving them the tools to do that provides kind of less conflict during the application process itself. I see you have a microphone, so I, I don't know if it's burning in your hand yet. But. Hi, uh, myself Shraddha, and I work for Ahmedabad University. So um, I have one question, which is a very uh, kind of a India focused and based. You mentioned very well that, you know, there are broad categories of students when it comes to counseling them and as per you, you know, design and customize your whole situation accordingly. So uh, now see, India is a very competitive market, right? India itself, excluding the universities outside of India. So, uh, and uh, now you see so many upcoming universities talking about exciting things, right? And which is amazing, but uh, as a counselor, if I put myself in your shoes, I do understand gets overwhelming at the same time because you mentioned you get a bunch of, you know, requests of coming and doing something, collaborating, and all of them sounds exciting, but, you know, one can do so much in 24 hours, right? So what I want to know basically is um, uh, your uh, perspective on on the basis of conversations you have with the students who are going to be applying to the Indian universities, what are the most uh, you know, uh, painful or I would say a challenge that comes up again and again? And on the basis of that, what is it that you feel I wish or I want to propose upcoming Indian universities to do other than the fairs, other than virtual affairs, other than you know, doing a session? I mean, any it could be, you know, anything that you feel, I wish they did this because that would make a longer sustainable sort of an impact, right? Rather than trying to focus on, you know, I want a return of investment the very next year. So what's what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think in India, there are two types of university. There are universities which focuses on scores they admit students based on scores only. And there are uh, new upcoming universities that we see in IC3, such as Ahmedabad University and other um, liberal arts colleges, which you know focuses on not just academics, but extracurriculars as well. And they have a different uh, you know, uh, kind of requirement uh, when it comes to admissions. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, as a counselor, uh, you know, I would expect that such kind of universities, which has newly designed courses, if they can, um, you know, uh, offer uh, short courses, say uh, one month or two month short courses to, you know, make them college ready. Because what happens is most of the schools in India, uh, they focus on scores. They are, you know, score focused uh, schools they do not focus on the overall character building. So most of the students are not mentally prepared for such kind of universities, wherein, wherein universities expect them to be all rounder, not just, you know, uh, being topper in the classroom. So I think students are not prepared for that thing. And when what happens is, when they get into such universities, such liberal arts colleges, wherein they focus on um, skill learning and other things, they're not prepared for it. So they cannot, you know, uh, utilize the resources while being on campus. So anything that university can, you know, uh, do wherein students can be prepared for, you know, uh, such kind of colleges would be helpful, not just in the admission, but I think even after that, during the three or four years. So you mean so, summer programs, short term summer programs would be one of the ways it, towards. Yeah, it could it be summer programs. It could be some internships. Yeah, yeah. So they would be mentally prepared and the I think the transition would be, you know, easier. Yeah, yeah. As a counselor, I face the challenge of convincing a parent or a student to go for a private university, which is like working on the plan uh, in this, uh, this level of education, like they have expensive also. 
Can I have two minutes? Yeah, this okay. it is not asked to me because I have a, <clears throat> I have a past with Ahmedabad University. Uh, I mean, uh, the major difference that I see between uh, Indian private universities and uh, working for a foreign university, Indian private universities are way, way more open. And you have to, as any Indian private universities, you have to leverage that. Honestly speaking, uh, uh, you know, two major places where I don't see Indian universities leveraging is one is alumni connection. Believe me, Indian universities have phenomenal alumni connection in virtually every part of India. And one alumni or one good alumni is three recruiters put together is what they do. And, and therefore, I was while when I was in India, I, I always banked on some of my past student and I would say I can meet you with one of the great student in Rajkot and I can I can till date give five names to Rachna is like your school SN Kansagra five students who are my students and call them and they can talk more about my university so that is one which a lot of my university in Canada for example University of Waterloo doesn't let me leverage the advancement and alumni connection for the purpose of outreach we are two uh, departments pole apart so that's one uh, that one thing I feel is worth leveraging for a lot of Indian universities, and I know a lot of, a lot of universities do leverage. And second is uh, professors and their research connections. Again, the foreign universities, Americans, British, German, Canadian, uh, their professors are not that mingling with the undergrads to talk about research or work with that. Where, where I see with my experience and uh, private universities in India, the professors are way more friendly. And I have been flooded with a lot of requests from my guidance counselor colleagues here is like, can your professor get in touch with one of my students? He is doing research on quantum computing. And I would make a very sad face and say, sorry, my professors don't get into outreach. They really don't want to work for. That's not the case with uh, Indian professors. They're way more friendly. They'll be happy to come up on Zoom for an hour and talk about a student's research or even uh, grad students, you know. So uh, these are the connections. So build bridges, as Rachna said, for short-term programs, research uh, thing, because every student knows that now, you know, academics, but then a lot other thing that you do beyond academics makes a lot of sense and a lot of weight in your application. So try and bridge the connections from the other side and you will find great results coming up. My hunch. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. I'm going to have to cut, cut this, this off because we're running out of time. Um, but thanks, thanks, thanks for all so the much. questions today. And thank you, the three of you, for, for being amazing. Um, so I'm sure we're all having to stay for a few minutes. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to come up um, and hopefully that helped you identify some things to do. I am also leaving you with kind of other alternatives that are, you know, different things that I've seen universities do as well. So uh, those are those are some additional things that you could be doing at your university. But thank you guys for the attentive audience. We really appreciate everything. Um, and we'll be here if you have any further questions or want to exchange cards or anything.